My name is Dr. Mark Algy, and in this introduction video, we'll be discussing Rachel Carson, her book, Silent Spring, in relation to functional medicine and our patient's health. Secondly, we'll discuss estrogen mimickers and insecticides, fossil fuels, plastics, and cosmetics. Thirdly, we will talk about Dr. Edward Nippling's work with DDT and his opinion of Silent Spring. Finally, we will discuss insect resistance and Rachel Carson's detractors. As with all my lectures I start off with, always do what's in your best long-term interest, and believing in repeating statements by your leadership may not be in your best long-term interest. And while it's easy to say don't follow incompetent leadership, the reality is evolution instructs us to follow leaders even when they are inept. I'm a chiropractor and I treat patients who are sick, suffering from autoimmunity, chronic pain, or a variety of ailments with chiropractic care and functional medicine. I personally developed an autoimmune condition in Bakersfield, California, and one of the reasons for that was my exposure to pesticides. Through my research for my own health issues, in time I came across Silent Spring and discovered that Rachel Carson had known that the bioaccumulation of man-made toxic chemicals could destroy us. Pesticides in agriculture are one of the reasons, on top of the population and motor vehicles, that California, which has the fifth largest economy in the world, also has some of the most toxic cities in the continental United States. For those of us who practice functional medicine, we know there are 144,000 new man-made chemicals since the chemical revolution. A large portion of these chemicals are toxic. Toxic chemicals increase inflammation, which interferes with the way the body makes ATP and neurotransmitters. Increased inflammation also contributes to chronic pain, depression, fatigue, and cancer. Statistics continue to show an increase in autoimmunity as we witness the continued degradation of our patients' health. Sadly, we continue to see an increase in autoimmunity in our younger patients. Before our time in 1962, a woman by the name of Rachel Carson wrote a book. In that book, she asked the questions that we ponder today, specifically what impact will man-made toxic chemicals have upon the health of our species? While she did not have the experience as a healthcare provider, she knew all too well these toxic chemicals would cause health problems. Her master's was in zoology, and it's interesting to note how many things we discuss and treat in our patients that she had already contemplated. Some of the highlights in her book that stood out in relation to functional medicine and in relation to health care to me were how man-made toxic chemicals that our bodies have to deal with are outside the limits of our biological experience, meaning we don't have the evolutionary development for our systems to detoxify these chemicals that are outside of our evolutionary design, how the common person can use biological potent chemicals in their hands without understanding the full repercussions of their use. How many times have we seen people pour toxic chemicals into the environment, into the toilet, into the sink, in their backyard? How humans are born with toxic man-made chemicals in utero? We're going to watch a video on this later on. How toxic chemicals may lay dormant in a person's body for months or years until health symptoms manifest? How many times have we placed a patient on a detox and all their maladies cleared up? How insecticides can cause sterility? The toxic pollution of our water? How the spraying of pesticides for insects is taken up by our future food supply, thus we consume these toxic insecticides? So an example, you spray these pesticides on a farm, it rains, the insecticides wash out into the river, the fish then take up these insecticides. How women are more susceptible to toxic chemicals than men are, something that every healthcare practitioner who deals with autoimmunity knows by the gender of our patients. She states on page 237 how synthetic estrogens in cosmetics, drugs, and foods are accumulating in human bodies. She knew this 60 years ago, and we see it in our practices every day. Technical note, estrogen. So whether we're saying synthetic estrogen, estrogen mimickers, or xenoestrogens, consider all these words interchangeable for this presentation. Rachel Carson knew this would affect us in ways we could never dream of in the form of sterilization. The first reason you wish to avoid insecticides is because they act as estrogen mimickers. Estrogen is the hormone that turns young females into women, and it does this by helping them put on and gain body fat. Estrogen mimickers also help you and I put on weight. Now, I speak for myself as an American. I personally don't need any help in this department. Too many estrogen mimickers in the environment can cause the feminization of males, male birds, male alligators, male frogs, male fish, and male humans. These feminizing chemicals are in the air we breathe, the food we eat, and the water we drink. Fossil fuels, pesticides, and plastics contaminate everything we consume. Remember, in the long run, there is no separation between us and our environment. Secondly, insecticides lower libido. Well, once again, I speak for myself. As an aging beta male, I don't need elevated female hormones. Lastly, you wish to avoid insecticides because they destroy neurons. All these life forms have something in common. They breathe, they eat, they replicate, they use an energy molecule called ATP, and they have a nervous system. DDT destroys neurons in the nervous system. Can DDT tell the difference between a bird's neuron, an insect's neuron, a whale neuron, or a human neuron? 
One of the things that a lot of us are unaware of is that fossil fuels contain estrogen mimickers, as do the pesticides and plastics made from fossil fuels. When you drive a vehicle that uses gasoline or diesel, that fuel is not burned 100% and escapes into the air. Unburned fuel called hydrocarbons contain estrogen mimickers. You and every other being on this planet that requires oxygen breathes in these substances. The most common female hormone mimicker in plastics is bisphenol A, or more commonly known as BPA. We've been using modern plastics since the late 1960s. I can almost guarantee you, you ate something stored in plastic today. All the water you will drink, all the water you'll bathe in, cook your food in, has been through plastic pipes or stored in plastic containers. All of the cosmetics, shampoos, facial creams, hydrating lotions, toothpaste, and deodorants are stored in plastic containers. BPA from the container is transferred into the substance inside. Then you place the lotion or deodorant on your skin and you absorb the BPA. So that's how we're getting estrogen mimickers for our environment. Now are you starting to see the issue we face? Now let's move on to insects. This is Dr. Edward Nippling, the winner of the World Food Prize in 1992, the Japan Prize in 1995, and the President's National Medal of Science in 1967. He authored two books on insecticide control. He was the director of the Orlando Laboratory on Emergency Research to protect U.S. and allied armed forces from the disease-carrying insects that spread malaria, typhus, and plague. Overall, the USDA employed him for 41 years. I cannot stress to you the importance of this man and his friend and colleague, Dr. Raymond Bushland. These two men impact everyone on this planet that consumes California fruit. The New York Times Magazine proclaimed on January 11, 1970, that Nippling had been credited by some of the scientists as having come up with the single most original thought in the 20th century. That was for the invention of the sterile insert technique. What does the founder of this technique, the past director in charge of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, who's also responsible for the testing of DDT, the development of DDT, the experimentation of DDT, have to say about Silent Spring? Some tried to discredit some of the things that she had written in there. But I, uh, I looked at it a little bit differently. I read her, uh, her book in, in detail. And the only fine thing I could find fault with was that she did not consider the benefits in relation to the hazards. She did not weigh these two. But what she said in her book, the claims that she made of what some of these hazards were, as far as I could tell, were based on sound scientific information. She had done her homework. By watching this simple video, you will know more about insect resistance than people who are voted into public office, economists who write books about DDT, political columnists, journalists, and talk show hosts, and their viewers. Both the mosquito in Africa and the medfly in California have something in common. They both became resistant to insecticides. All insects within a few generations, ranging from 2 to 20 years, will develop resistance to the insecticides used to kill them. A technical note here. Pesticides kill pests. A pesticide can be an insecticide, an herbicide, a rodenticide, a bactericide, a fungicide, or a laricide. An insecticide is a specific pesticide. Understanding insect resistance is important to understanding the comeback of malaria. This chart of insect resistance in Nepal tells us all we need to know. You had the introduction of DDT and malaria cases dropped. That was good. Then mosquitoes developed resistance to DDT in 1974. However, Nepal continued to use DDT until 1990. The United States banned DDT for local use in agricultural in 1972, which simply happened to coincide around the time mosquitoes became resistant to DDT. Let me make it perfectly clear. Rachel Carson had zero impact upon the mosquitoes becoming resistant to DDT. Evolution was responsible for that, with or without her book. Let's discuss Rachel Carson's detractors who will tell us that insecticide poisons, such as DDT, is good for me. I'll be referring to these men as the members in the cult of DDT. That might sound a little harsh, but you'll see why it's appropriate later on. With all cult members, they abdicated reason and replaced it with emotions. Let me use an analogy here. What if I said rat poison was 100% safe 100% of the time, no matter how it was used? You'd think I was insane. Rat poison is not safe, but used properly, it will minimize any negative potential impacts to the environment, to predatory birds that eat rats and mice. The cult members of DDT will tell you that the insecticide DDT is 100% safe, 
100% of the time, no matter how it is used. This is called Indoor Residual Spraying, or IRS. DDT is sprayed directly onto the house walls and it creates a barrier that repels mosquitoes, preventing the transmission of malaria to the residents. IRS is a very focused direct application of DDT versus this general overused application for malaria control that we did in the 1940s and 1950s. Which method do you think contaminates waterways, fish, birds, and humans? If the proponents of DDT simply said DDT is a poison and they need to be used with caution, that would be one thing, but that's not what they're saying. They're saying DDT is 100% safe, 100% of the time, no matter how it is applied. This is where educated men have left the world of being rational and become willing disciples of DDT. Later on, we'll discuss how these men, like good cult members, will rewrite and modify the past to make their hero, DDT, look good in all situations all the time. Some of them will even say all the scientific papers written in different countries by different authors in different agencies, different universities, and different governments demonstrating the negative effects of DDT on birds, animals, frogs, and alligators are fake and part of a scientific global conspiracy. A global conspiracy? It sounds like a cult to me. I'm going to change subjects for a moment and then get back into our topic. In the Vietnam War, you had two groups of men who had very different experiences. You had men fighting in the trenches, and you had men living on large bases in relative comfort. Bases such as Long Bin Post. It housed 60,000 American military personnel. This base had air conditioning, restaurants, swimming pools, a library, a post office, wood shops, bars, and nightclubs. For the men posted there, it was a relatively easy lifestyle. Then you had men out in the trenches, in the muck, in the mud, the swamps, no air conditioning, no entertainment, no restaurants, no wood shops, no nightlife, no bars, in the trenches, sleeping in a hospitable environment. If I want to know what fighting a war is like, who would I ask? The guy in the trenches who understands the reality of the situation? Or should I ask the guy who lives in the air-conditioned rooms, lounging around the swimming pool? Let's listen to what a grunt way back when had to say. Now, they sit back in air-conditioned rooms and say, okay, you, you, you guys go out there and fight the war. We'll tell you where to go and how to do it. So applying this to our situation, if I want to know how to fight the war against malaria and insects using DDT, whom should I believe? The men in the trenches or the men back on base in the air-conditioned rooms lounging around the swimming pool? DDT cult members will erroneously say that Rachel Carson was at fault for malaria making a comeback. Remember, at this point, you know more than all of these men combined when discussing insect resistance. So when I tell you, always do what's in your best long-term interest, this is what I mean. Carson's book prompted the Enviro wackos to promote a U.S. and worldwide ban on DDT, that remarkable insecticide which had successfully controlled malaria. Now, thanks to DDT, the death toll was whittled down to approximately a few hundred, with the promise of eliminating malaria-carrying mosquitoes for all time. This man did not do what was in his best long-term interest, and he made the mistake of believing and repeating the statements of his leadership, which was also not in his best long-term interest. His DDT had all but eradicated malaria. Then came Rachel Carlson's silent springboard. Getting agitated is not in your best interest, but if you're going to make massive amounts of the stress hormone cortisol, maybe you should get upset about something that's a real thing. If you're going to accelerate your aging, damage your hippocampus, cause heart disease and diabetes, maybe you should do that over a substantive issue. So let us recap the situation we face. We're getting estrogen mimickers from fossil fuels for 170 years, estrogen mimickers from pesticides for 75 years, and estrogen mimickers from plastics for 50 years. What do you think this is doing to males? Remember, we all start out as females in the womb. Introduction of the male hormone testosterone changes Jenny into Johnny both the brain structures and genitals. Introduction of too many female hormones inhibits this process. Sex. Millennials are not having as much of it as their parents or grandparents did. In fact, according to research published in the Archives of Sexual Behavior, if you're between the ages of 22 and 37, you're having the least sex out of anybody. Be thinking about that for a little while. It's hard to believe it's true, yeah. Believe it. Google it. Deny it if you want, but the numbers are in. And sex therapist Susan Wenzel agrees. There are several reasons, according to Wenzel, you might be a sexless millennial. So people are generally tired. 
So that's one reason. Millennials are actually workaholics according to the research. They live in urban settings with less community to help them do the chores and tasks of daily living. They marry less. Millennials take on more financial responsibilities than previous generations. Wenzel says it all translates to less energy for the bedroom. Studies show a decrease in semen count by 60% in 40 years due to an elevation of female hormones. Young people aren't having sex and birth rates are dropping globally. People will theorize why young people are not having sex. They'll discuss parental involvement, stress, social pressures, work, body image, dating apps. However, remember, sex hormones influence behavior. When you tinker with sex hormones, you tinker with behavior. We've been tinkering with our hormones for over 170 years. Maybe the loss of energy is a loss of sexual vitality. This is no longer a theoretical model of human health. We are living in the largest health crisis we have ever faced, and we have no mechanism to change it. It's been theorized that human beings will destroy themselves in one of two ways either through nuclear war or environmental decline. Apparently, we have chosen the second option. In closing, it is my opinion that we do not have the mental capacity, the political will, or the understanding of the toxic feminizing chemical situation we face. We've been dumping feminizing estrogen mimickers into our water, food, and air for 170 years. We're not going to undo this chemical salt on ourselves in a weekend. We have no great replacement for fossil fuels, and corporate America is in no way interested in finding one.